Chapter Six, Part Two of Life of Henry David Thoreau by Henry Salt. It has already been stated that Thoreau's sympathies were enlisted from his earliest manhood in the cause of abolition, and that he was himself instrumental in furthering the escape of a fugitive slave. Another instance of this kind has been recorded by Mr. Conway, who was introduced to Thoreau by Emerson in the summer of 1853. Footnote, Fraser, April 1866. End footnote. When I went to the house next morning, I found them all in a state of excitement by reason of the arrival of a fugitive Negro from the South who had come fainting to their door about daybreak and thrown himself on their mercy i sat and watched the singularly lowly and tender devotion of the scholar to the slave he must be fed his swollen feet bathed and he must think of nothing but rest again and again this coolest and calmest of men drew near to the trembling negro and bade him feel at home and have no fear that any power should again wrong him he could not walk this day but must mount guard over the fugitive for slave hunters were not extinct in those days and so i went away after a while much impressed by many little traits that i had seen as they appeared in this emergency and not much disposed to cavil at their source, whether Bible or Bhagavat. At this time Thoreau's mind was a good deal occupied with the question of slavery, for in 1850 the iniquitous fugitive slave law had been passed by act of Congress, and in the spring of 1854 the heart of Massachusetts had been stirred by the case of Anthony Burns, an escaped slave who was sent back by the authorities of the state in compliance with the demand of his owner. This event formed the main topic of Thoreau's essay on slavery in Massachusetts, which was delivered as an address at the anti-slavery celebration at Framingham in 1854, on which occasion the Constitution of the United States was publicly burned by Lloyd Garrison, an incident which may explain the passionate tone of Thoreau's paper. For my part, he said, my oldest and worthiest pursuits have lost I cannot say how much of their attraction and i feel that my investment in life here is worth many per cent less since massachusetts last deliberately sent back an innocent man anthony burns to slavery in his kindred essay on civil disobedience when dealing with this same subject of state-supported slavery he had expressed the conviction that if but one honest man in the state of Massachusetts were to withdraw his allegiance as a protest against this iniquity, and to be imprisoned, therefore, it would be the abolition of slavery in America. This was written before the appearance of John Brown. In 1854 occurred the most memorable event of Thoreau's literary life the publication of Walden by Messrs. Tickner and Company of Boston. The greater part of the book was drawn from the journal kept by Thoreau during his residence in the woods, but there are also passages which were written at a later date, when he was working his materials into their ultimate form. The inducement to Thoreau to give the story of his sojourn at Walden to the world was, he tells us, that very particular inquiries had been made by his townsmen concerning the manner of his life, and that he felt he had something to say which bore not remotely on the social condition of the inhabitants of Concord. 
the result justified the expectations of the author in writing the book and of the publishers in printing it for in spite of the ridicule and hostility of some critics a great deal of interest was aroused by walden and the edition appears to have been sold out in the course of a few years in marked contrast to the unsaleableness of its predecessor the week footnote in march eighteen fifty five the new york knickerbocker devoted an article entitled town and rural humbugs to a comparison of barnum and thoreau and declared walden to be the antidote of barnum's autobiography walden was reviewed in putnam's magazine in eighteen fifty four and was noticed in this country in chambers journal for november eighteen fifty seven under the title of an american diogenes and footnote from whatever point of view it be regarded walden is undoubtedly thoreau's masterpiece it contains the sum and essence of his ideal philosophy it is written in his most powerful and incisive style while by the freshness and naivete of its narrative it excites the sympathy and imagination of the reader and wins a popularity far exceeding that of his other writings welcome englishman welcome englishman thoreau exclaimed in walden for i had had communication with that race a young englishman mr chumley is just now waiting for me to take a walk with him he writes in a letter dated the first of october eighteen fifty four this was mr thomas chumley of overley cheshire a nephew of bishop heber and six years thoreau's junior in age the only englishman it appears with whom thoreau ever became intimate he spent some time with thoreau at concord accompanying him on a visit to mr ricketson a friend who lived at new bedford and the strong personal admiration which this travelled english gentleman conceived for the concord hermit is one of many testimonies to thoreau's singularly impressive character a correspondence was maintained after mr chumley's return to europe in eighteen fifty five and towards the end of that year thoreau received a splendid gift of oriental books from his english friend who knew how deep an interest he felt in buddhist literature mr chumley again visited concord in eighteen fifty nine in later years he took the name of owen he succeeded to the condover estate near shrewsbury in eighteen sixty three and died in the following year increasing fame brought thoreau an increasing number of friends while his intimacy with emerson alcott and channing continued as close as ever one of these later friends and correspondents was mr daniel ricketson their first meeting was at christmas eighteen fifty four when thoreau then on his way to lecture at nantucket paid a passing visit to new bedford and spent a day or two in mr ricketson's house on presenting himself to his host he was at first mistaken as on several other occasions for a peddler of small wares but this unfavorable impression was quickly corrected when he gave proof of his singular conversational powers the points in his personal appearance which particularly arrested mr ricketson's attention were his keen blue eyes full of the greatest humanity and intelligence and next to these his sloping shoulders in which he resembled emerson long arms and short sturdy legs which generally enabled him to outwalk his companions in his daily excursions in mr f b sanborn who as a young man came to live at concord 
early in 1855, Thoreau found another friend with whom he gradually became intimate. The first impressions of Thoreau, as recorded at the time by one who was destined to be his biographer a quarter of a century later, are extremely interesting. Thoreau looks eminently sagacious, like a sort of wise wild beast. He dresses plainly, wears a beard in his throat, and has a brown complexion. Thoreau's beard, which is here for the first time mentioned, must have been of quite recent growth, for in the crayon portrait of 1854 he appears as beardless. Thoreau's friendship with Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune, had been kept up since his visit to Staten Island chiefly by letter, for Thoreau was seldom at New York. But Greeley had done him valuable service at a critical period in obtaining publication for several of his articles in Graham, Putnam, and other magazines, and in acting generally as a literary friend and adviser. Greeley had a farm at Chappaqua, 36 miles north of New York, and in the early part of 1856 he pressed Thoreau to come to reside at this place and act as tutor to his children, which offer seems to have been for a time seriously entertained. It was in the following November, when Thoreau accompanied Alcott on a short visit to Chappaqua, that he had a memorable interview with an even more powerful and remarkable personality than his own. The meeting of Thoreau with Walt Whitman, of the author of Walden and the author of Leaves of Grass, is told by Thoreau in his letters to Mr. Blake. It is remarkable, when one considers the strong dissimilarity between the two men, types as they are of different sides of human nature, the thrifty, simple, self-complete type, as opposed to the largely inclusive and sympathetic, that Thoreau should have so rightly appreciated, after one short conversation, the breath of Whitman's genius, and should have recognized in him the greatest Democrat the world has seen, one who suggested something a little more than human. To be sure, wrote Thoreau, I sometimes feel a little imposed on. By his hardiness and broad generalities, he puts me into a liberal frame of mind, prepared to see wonders, as it were, sets me upon a hill or in the midst of a plain, stirs me well up, and then throws in a thousand of brick. Though rude and sometimes ineffectual, it is a great primitive poem an alarum or trumpet note ringing through the American camp. Wonderfully like the Orientals, too, considering that when I asked him if he had read them, he answered, No, tell me about them. I did not get far in conversation with him, two more being present, and among the few things I chanced to say, I remember that one was in answer to him as representing America, that I did not think much of America or of politics and so on, which may have been somewhat of a damper to him. Since I have seen him, I find that I am not disturbed by any brag or egoism in his book. He may turn out the least of a braggart of all, having a better right to be confident. He is a great fellow." We can only regret that Whitman, on his part, left no record of his impressions of Thoreau. But it is interesting, in this connection, to note the mention of Thoreau in Specimen Days in America. On the 17th of September, 1881, when visiting Concord, Whitman met Emerson, Alcott, Louisa Alcott, and other Concord friends. A good deal of talk, he records, the subject Henry Thoreau. 
some new glints of his life and fortunes with letters to and from him, one of the best by Margaret Fuller, others by Horace Greeley, Channing, etc., one from Thoreau himself, most quaint and interesting. Mr. Sanborn informs me that on this occasion Whitman expressed a high opinion of Thoreau. In the following year, Thoreau had the satisfaction of meeting another of the great figures of American democracy. John Brown, then fresh from his anti-slavery struggle in Kansas, was a guest at Mr. Sanborn's house in March 1857, and was introduced by his host to Emerson, Alcott, Thoreau, and other Concord friends. It was arranged that Brown should address a meeting in the town hall on the subject of slaveholding. On the day appointed, says Mr. Sanborn, Brown went up from Boston at noon and dined with Mr. Thoreau, then a member of his father's family, and residing not far from the railroad station. Footnote. Memoirs of John Brown, 1878. End footnote. The two idealists, both of them in revolt against the civil government because of its base subservience to slavery, found themselves friends from the beginning of their acquaintance. They sat after dinner discussing the events of the border warfare in Kansas and Brown's share in them, when, as it often happened, Mr. Emerson called at Mr. Thoreau's door on some errand to his friend. Thus the three men met under the same roof, and found that they held the same opinion of what was uppermost in the mind of Brown. Emerson and Thoreau were both present at the meeting in the evening, when Brown produced a thrilling effect on his audience by his earnestness and eloquence, and by the display of the very chain wore by one of his sons who had been made prisoner and tortured by the champions of slavery. From that time there were many people in Concord who were favorable to Brown's cause. On the occasion of one of his visits to Mr. Ricketson at Brooklawn, New Bedford, Thoreau surprised the company by an unexpected outburst of hilarity, under which impulse he sang Tom Bowling, and finally entered upon an improvised dance. Mr. Ricketson, not being able to stand what appeared at the time the somewhat ludicrous appearance of our Walden hermit, retreated to his shanty a short distance from his house, whilst the more humor-loving Alcott remained to see the entertainment. Thoreau afterwards told his sister Sophia that in the excitement of this dance he had made a point of treading on the toes of the guileless Alcott. Here is an extract from Alcott's diary in 1857. First of April, 1857. At Mr. Ricketson's, two and a half miles from New Bedford, a neat country residence, surrounded by wild pastures and low woods, the little stream Okushnet flowing east of the house and into Fairhaven Bay at the city. Ricketson's tastes are pastoral, simple even to wildness, and he passes a good part of his day in the fields and woods, or in his rude shanty near his house, where he writes and reads his favorite authors, Cooper having the first place in his affections. He is in easy circumstances, and has the manners of an English gentleman, frank, hospitable, and with positive persuasions of his own, a man to feel on good terms with, and reliable as to the things good and true, mercurial perhaps, and wayward a little sometimes. 3rd of April, A.M. In House and Shanty. Thoreau and Ricketson treating of nature and the wild. 
the row has visited Ricketson before and won him as a disciple, though not in the absolute way he has Blake of Worcester, whose love for his genius partakes of the exceeding tenderness of women, and is a pure platonism to the fineness and delicacy of the devotee's sensibility. But Ricketson is himself, and plays the manly part in the matter, defending himself against the master's tough thoroughcraft with spirit and ability. Mr. Blake's estimate of Thoreau's character has already been quoted. Equally interesting is that given me by Mr. Ricketson, with which this chapter may fitly conclude. On this point, I can bear my own testimony, that without any formality he was remarkable in his uprightness and honesty, industrious and frugal, simple though not fastidious in his tastes, whether in food, dress, or address, an admirable conversationist, and a good storyteller, not wanting in humor. His full blue eye, aquiline nose, and peculiarly pursed lips added much to the effect of the descriptive powers. He was a man of rare courage, physically and intellectually. In the way of the former, he arrested two young fellows on the lonely road leading to his hermitage by Walden Pond, who were endeavoring to entrap a young woman on her way home, and took them to the village. Intellectually, his was a strong, manly mind, enriched by a classical education and extensive knowledge of history, ancient and modern, and English literature, himself a good versifier, if not true poet, whose poetic character is often seen in his prose works. End of chapter 6